Okay, you're good to go now, Councillor. Thanks very much. Welcome everybody to the uh, February the 3rd meeting of the uh, Accounts and Audit Committee. The first item is attendances. I think we're just missing Councillor Evans and Councillor Mitchell, uh, so we'll put their apologies in. They might join us later on in the meeting. I don't think anybody else has got any other apologies, have we? I've just I've sent a text to Councillor Evans, and I'm just sending an email to Councillor Mitchell, so see what happens. Yeah. Thanks very much. They can join us. Join yeah, yeah. yeah. And Nikki Bishop sends her apologies to yeah, you. Yeah, so I, have, I did have Nikki's yeah. apology. I've forgotten about that, yes, yeah. Item two is questions for members of the public. Have we had any? Not received any, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. It's more power for the course. Item three is minutes of the last meeting. Can we agree those as a true and correct record? Agree. We all in favour? Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Item four is a strategic risk update. That's actually been deferred into part two, the confidential section, for fairly obvious reasons. It's a report, obviously, on cyber security. Item five is the external audit progress report. I believe Karen from Mazars is going to do that. I am. Thank you, Chair. It's a verbal update um, just to confirm for members that I think at the last meeting we said we had some small amounts of outstanding work to complete, uh, particularly in relation to property plans and equipment valuations. Uh, and there were some other areas of work outstanding. But once all of that was finished, we would uh, sign the Council's audit report. Um, the work on property plant and equipment valuations has taken us significantly longer to complete than we thought because we have had some challenges in getting information from the valuer to support the information that is included in the council's accounts. We've been working really hard with them, but there have been a number of uh, factors that have contributed to that delay. Uh, one of which is that they've had some IT problems at um, the council's external valuer's side, which means they haven't been able to provide uh, information due to uh, difficulties in accessing their own systems. Um, we are now, as of today, in a position where we have three relatively small outstanding queries that the valuer needs to comment uh, back to us on, at which point we will be able to uh, conclude the audit. There are some unadjusted errors that we will need to report back to you through our audit completion letter, which we'll send out um, relating to the um, difficulties we've had, I guess, and the errors in the underlying data that the valuer uh, has been able to provide now. Uh, but we will just report those back to you. I think members, if I take you back to this time last year or a little bit earlier this uh, last year, will recall that there were some similar issues with the 1819 uh, valuation information. And I'm afraid they have really um, sort of repeated themselves again uh, this year, really, and presented us with a particular challenge. But I, just to reiterate, I think we are literally now days away from being able to sign the audit report. Thanks very much, Karen. Any questions from members? I'm looking for the... no. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Item uh, six is the uh, Treasury Management Strategy, and I believe uh, Frank Fallon is going to do that. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, hi. Hi. Hey. Uh, Hey, you know what, I'll just um, run through some of the key aspects of the um, strategy, if that's okay. Um, so primary purpose of the report is to allow members to review and ultimately for the council to approve the treasury management strategy for the next three years. And there's three key aspects of this strategy. There's the debt strategy, the investment strategy, and then prudential and limits. In, in the report, Economic update and a medium financial activity. So, the uh, economic forecast. Uh, obviously, dominated the pandemic. Uh, so, there's been a negative impact on the world economy. And the current forecast is for the a slow and gradual recovery to begin later this calendar year. Um, what this means for the Treasury activity is that the current interest rates. We are sitting for at least a few years. Will impact on our debt investment activity. So, the debt strategy, um, the main item we've had is the PWLB consultation, which the outcome of which was in November. Frank, um, Frank can I just interrupt? The, yeah. 
there's a bit of a bandwidth problem, I think. If you, if you turn it uh, off uh, and just speak, that might help sometimes. Okay. Yeah. That help. Carry on. So the outcome of the PWB consultation is um, the reduced borrowing rates by one second, addition to placement for uh, purely financial benefit. Um, so this has reduced the cost of borrowing for the council, but there are no plans. Uh, for us to borrow additional amounts outside of that required to support the capital program. This means the total debt is estimated to 100 million at the end of this year, rising to 671 million by the end of March 2024. Um, so, uh, thank, key, thank you, breaking up. Um, okay. Uh, I just um, I just try and get some of the key bits out then if I can. Um, yeah. So the key item in the investment bit is that we'd like to increase the number of approved building societies from two to ten. Uh, the reason for this is that the current economic climate is making finding uh, competitive places to invest difficult. So by increasing the number of building societies on our approved list, that should help with that process. Um, and then we have the, um, I think there's all, there's all in the cases, uh, in a, so those can be, um, We've lost you, Frank. Okay, can you hear me now? I think, I think the key, the key change was the um, was the change in policy around the building societies. Most of these strategies, the same as previous years, limit prudential indicators increased. No, we've lost you again. Graham, can you summarise? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, is, that, is it clear from me? Are you, yeah, are clear okay. Yeah. 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 So, so just finishing off from what Frank said, obviously the, the policy around the debt strategy, obviously we only borrow for our capital expenditure requirements. So to support the capital programme or the asset strategy, um, and within the report, section 3.13 just details where we see our overall borrowing levels for the council um, going to over the next few years. But it's purely in support of our expenditure plans for the capital programme and the asset strategy. Um, I think just to comment on the investment strategy, I think what Frank was saying is, Everything on the investment strategy is um, all focused around security of cash. Um, and I think what we're finding at the moment is um, the money market funds, which we use to invest our cash in the AAA rated funds, we've not got a significant volume of them. And I think what we're mindful of is we don't want to end up with all our eggs in one basket. So. What we've looked at to extend the number of counterparties, the people that we can invest with, is to look to extend um, the strategy to cover our top rated building societies. Um, some of these don't have credit ratings, building societies don't, and that's not necessarily an issue because what we look at on building societies is the value of their balance sheet. So it's, it's what assets have they got. Um, and just the strength of their balance sheet in terms of the net assets they've got. So we've taken the, the opportunity this time round to increase and extend our investment counterparties list to include those building societies. Um, the rest of the report, um, obviously, it does comply with, our, with the regulations which we need to comply with on Treasury, but it does detail. And I think 
the numbers part of the report are included in Appendix 3, which sets out our um, prudential indicators, particularly around the amount of borrowing and the borrowing limits that we um, impose on ourselves as a council. So the two main ones there that council approve each year is what we call the authorised um, limit for external debt. Now that is the maximum permissible ceiling. So we have to make sure we operate within that. Um, there is something there called the operational boundary, which is more of a day-to-day -day, um, limit that we try to operate within. So you've got the authorised limit, which is the real top upper limit, and the operational boundary, which is what we um, attempt to operate within, which is slightly lower than the authorised limit. Um, if, we, if, we, if we're achieving and reaching the operational boundary, we've got some slight concerns. Um, if we ever envisage we're going to exceed any of these limits, we must come back to your, yourselves and also to the council to seek approval um, and explain why we may be breaching any of those. Um, touch wood, we've never done that when we've set these indicators in previous years and we don't foresee that now. Um, so I think in terms of the overall report, I'm, just, I'm mindful that obviously we we had some training that was presented by Graham Perkins and the Link Group a couple of weeks ago, which hopefully you found useful because obviously our budget reports are quite long and detailed. Um, but I won't necessarily apologise for that. And I think that's just the nature of where we are as a local authority and that we spend a lot of money uh, and we invest a lot of money. And obviously we need to make sure we comply with all the relevant standards and guidance we've got. So I think the main change to this strategy this time is is the issue around extending the counterparties as to who we can invest with. Um, the rest of the strategy is broadly a roll forward from, from previous years. So I'm happy to take any questions if any of the committee has got any. Thanks, that's that. Thanks, uh, Frank. It's just technical problems. Yeah. Frank, uh, yeah. Anyway, any questions for, for Graham, really? Uh, Councillor Wynne Stanley? Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, it's just a question on negative interest rates because that was, to me, potentially quite worrying that big organisations are now starting to. Because negative interest rates, it's been a long time since my economics degree. Doesn't that mean we have to pay them to have our money? <laughs> It's again. You ask you ask questions that I was just asking last week when I was reading it. I've never known negative interest rates, and basically, we are for the privilege of people looking after our money. We would end up giving them a hundred pound and getting ninety nine pound back, as yeah. as an example. And it, it's interesting when you think, well, what causes it? And it, if we think, if we take just take a step back nationally this year. Obviously, the government have been putting more money into the money supply to borrow back off the central banks to basically give local government. Local government's been given a lot of money to bail out businesses. So that's increased the money supply. Businesses have got their money in effect from us. Businesses, and the way I'm thinking of it, businesses would ordinarily get money from customers. Customers at the moment probably sat on balances. So I think overall, what's what's creating this fear of negative interest rates, I think, is the volume of cash that either banks have got, businesses have got in their bank accounts, and it's finding safe havens for that money. So it's like a supply and demand on money. So they, they just don't want it. They don't want they the just, cash. They, they, they just don't just necessarily risk. want it. Yeah, and I, I think as, a, as an authority... Will we go into negative interest rates? I think the answer will be no. And I think the way the money markets work, and the, we, we invest in what they call money markets, which are AAA-backed um, investment instruments. I think they've said that rather than go negative, they will just cut the amount of fees they get from it. So I think at the moment, we are very low. Um the investments returns we get are probably if I said up to half a percent would be lucky. Yeah. Um but we we still get that return. Yeah. Um and we would hope we would still get a positive return, not negative. Yeah. 
Oh, right, thanks, ben. Ben. It comes down to security. Yeah, but that, that explains why you've expanded the number of building societies from two to ten to be able to increase that pot. Thank, thanks, Graham. That's, that's and spread the cash so yeah. we've not all got, uh, got our eggs in one basket. Yeah, we need to spread that. Got it. And let's hope negative interest rates don't spread throughout the rest of the economy. Eh? Yeah, God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. Councillor Coggins. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, Barry's covered some of my questions uh, um, and Graham's touched on them as well. So um, three different things. About the negative interest rate. So at um, 5.13, it says several of the banks the council uses have started to pay negative interest rates. Whereas later on, I think it's on page 23 in the economic forecast, it says the Monetary Policy Committee has squashed any idea of using negative interest rates. So I was I was wondering what's going on there or are we looking at two different economic levels where actually this is what's happening on the ground on a small scale and there's something else happening uh, uh, at the macro level um, or um, if they're written at different times. Um, then I also wanted to ask about the building society. So yes, I, I um, appreciate the comments Graham has given. So it mentioned here, um, the thing that worried me was it mentioned going to building societies regardless of their credit ratings. Um, but from what Graham is saying now, it mightn't be so much that they have a bad credit rating rather than just that they don't have a credit rating. And that's because they're outside of the credit rating system rather than be because they're um, risky. So I suppose just some clarification on that. Um, and again, if it's so we're moving from two building societies to 10, um, and obviously I see the reasons for doing that. And yet there was obviously a reason we chose to only be at two. So I'm wondering, why were we not at 10 before? So what is the alternative risk that we're taking on? Um, and the final one, the final one is a separate issue is about 5.4, where we talk about ethical investments and how there's, I suppose, a degree of tension between um, the zip for guidance saying we have to follow the slide principles on the one hand and the desire to follow ethical investment principles on the other hand. So I'm wondering how much tension there is really and how differently we will, we will be doing things if we weren't constricted by the SIPFA principles, which I realise are there for really good reasons. And um, specifically, I'm thinking of the example being pension funds, where um, the argument is, oh, well, they're really secure investing in these fossil fuel companies. Um, and yet we know that fossil fuel companies are not secure in the long term because there's a, a massive movement away from them. So three separate issues. Thank you. Thanks. Graham? Uh, I'll just respond on the first one, um, Councillor Coggins. I think I, I will double check the references about negative interest rates. I know um, I responded to Councillor Wynne Stanley on, on what I had understood last week. Um, there was articles from SIPFA on this last week. Um, I'm, I'm not expecting negative interest rates um, at this stage to affect, to affect the council. Um, I think that's just something I'll take back and we may just look at this um, report and just just firm up on, on those issues and the potential risks that that might get us. I think it's, it's a totally valid point and I think it's a really topical point because of what's come out recently. Um, the issue on building societies, um, I think if I, if if we just roll back 10 years, what happened with building societies and building societies were on local authorities' investment counterparty lists. So local authorities did invest in them. I think in the financial crash, I think the value of their balance sheets came under question, um, particularly around um, their ability to recover the amount of debt that they'd got outstanding, particularly when property values had, had, had reduced. So I think their balance sheets were weakened. And at that stage, um, in effect, they were dropped off local authorities' lists for that reason. The strength of the balance sheets was not sufficient uh, to give us the security we wanted when we were investing. I think the reason we had two, I think, and I'm, uh, obviously, I think Nationwide was one of them. Um, I wouldn't guess at the second one. It's obviously just the main big players at that stage. But I think we've taken the view now that there's more reliance and more reliability on their balance sheets. And I think we've set limits there that we would look at um, 
building societies with particularly sized balance sheets before we did any investing in them. Um, just in terms of ethical investments, I know it's something we have considered as part of this strategy before, and we have opened, I think, money market funds. I'll take it back to our treasury manager um, as to as to what's happened with those potentially green investment vehicles. Um, obviously, in terms of the pension authority, this is not something we've necessarily got a direct control over their investing. Um, I think... I would probably say that the treasury function and the investments around the treasury function are really tightly governed. Um, I know with the other aspect of the council's investments that it, does, that it does through the asset investment strategy, this has just been obviously updated uh, in the last couple of months to take into account and obviously prioritise investments that add um, social and economic um benefits and, and would take that on board in, in any investments we did there. That's not to say we we wouldn't look to invest in ethical things through the Treasury investment, but as, as we say, the governance is purely around SLI, the security, liquidity, yield priorities. Um, so I think on that, Geraldine, I will certainly take back the issue about the negative interest rates and just get clarity in this report as to, as to what some of the risks will be on that. And obviously, I'll question the Treasury manager about the ethical investment side as well. Thanks. That's, That's really good. helpful. I've, I've, I've put the references in the chat for it. Yeah. For the negative. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Sorry, Chair. Go. Plus the boys next, I think. Yeah, it's very, very briefly on the, on the negative interest bit. I mean, it's two reasons why they ever come about. One is allegedly to try and uh, get consumer spending and investment. Uh, which by making borrowing cheaper or whatever to encourage people to take money out of savings and spend it, which is particularly difficult at the time of COVID or whatever, because you can't spend anything really no. unless it's online. So that is, it's a, it's a, but the other thing is actually, it's, it's basically, it's quite simply to, uh, to cheapen the government's borrowing uh, costs interest wise. But I mean, uh, over time, it's, it's been shown that, that this policy doesn't really work. You know, Japan had it for quite a number of years going back into the, the like 2015 or whatever. Other countries have tried it. But by, by and large, it, it doesn't really achieve either of those objectives very, very, uh, very well. And consequently, it's unlikely to happen and it will end up just hovering around very, very low rates. As simple as that, I think. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Any other questions? I can't see any, anybody. Uh, right, so let's look, just trim my computer again. Hold on a minute. Mr. Chairman, sorry, just going back to one point, just got on the previous item. So I, I, I was just realised, and obviously it was just a verbal report for our external auditors. I assume that by the time we come to March the 23rd in our next meeting, there'll be a sort of complete report, you know, everything will have caught up with what's outstanding at the moment in their digging and delving into uh, uh, valuations and what have you. I'd just like to make that clear that I think we expect it to happen by then. Yeah. Can I just come back in on that? Oh, are you there, Karen? Yeah. Yeah. My intention is that as soon as we are in a position to um, sign off, which, as I said earlier, I'm hoping will be in the next few days, early, early part of next week, um, we will write to you uh, with an audit completion letter so that all members of the committee are clear in advance of the next meeting about a number of things. The first is that the audit is complete and the audit opinion has been issued. Uh, and the second is the matters arising from our work that were not reported to you at a previous meeting. So we can then discuss that letter if you if you wish to do so in the March meeting, but you will get the information before then. All right, thanks, Karen. That's absolutely okay. brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, just, just to mention, we know what well, we've during the last uh, debate, we're joined by uh, Councillor Evans and Councillor Mitchell. Uh, item seven, now we're on to, is uh, the budget monitoring report. Which I think, Graham, it's you again. It is, yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, a bit panic then, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> I think just this this report is is the report that went to the executive on the twenty fifth of Jan. Um, last week so it just sets out our projection um for revenue expenditure um as at period eight so it took account of what we knew up to the end of november uh, just some headlines from the report we have included in it um 
an executive summary just to try to to bring out some of the more pertinent points within this report but what what we're forecasting at the moment and it's it's a bit of a it's a more positive report than the previous um reports that we've presented this year and i think what we've what we're forecasting at the moment is an underspend of 2.1 million um i would caveat that to say that at the time we drafted the report was prior to the latest national lockdown um which will have an impact and will have an adverse impact but the extent that that adverse impact is covered by some of the government um safety nets that there exist for example if i if i use one example around um school catering um where we recover income from schools catering if we, if the schools are closed and we're not doing that so it, it ends up as a loss of income and a pressure on the budget but in, in respect to sales fees and charges government have got a compensation scheme for that so so there are caveats to say we've still got some some pressures that we're still quantifying but like i say it's it's a relatively good news position that we're forecasting an underspend of 2.1 million now the reasons for that and it's quite a positive movement since the previous report at period six, I think, is that within the projections, we were including some allowances for anticipated increases in children's care costs and adults' care costs as a result of COVID. Um, and what, what we're thinking at the moment is that we're not seeing that demand and that pressure coming through. And that's probably because we're still in the in the midst of of the coronavirus issues so we've not seen that additional pressure come forward so at this stage we've been able to release back some contingency budgets that we've got within the overall projections and that's led to that underspend position i think what it's worth saying though is that in respect to council tax and business rates and what we forecast will be available to support budget when we set the budget last february um, we will see shortfalls in collection of council tax and collection of business rates. And across the two areas, I put the figures there, council tax is about 5.3 million, business rates is about 3.5 million. What government said is, we don't want you to chalk that up against your outturn position in 2021. We want you to, in effect, spread that deficit over the next three years. And that's not Trafford, that's for all local governments. So basically, they've taken the pressure away from us this year. So had they not done that, there'd have been another £8 million pressure in year. So we're not out of the woods. Um, what, what government said in terms of the council tax and business rates is you can, you can in effect, smooth that problem um, over the next few years. What this position means for reserves overall is quite positive in that any underspend we do get at year end will be transferred to reserves to bolster reserves. And I think if you remember at draft budget stage, um, there was reference to using reserves um, to cover the budget in 21-22 and to cover some of those pressures that were carrying on from as a result of COVID. Um, and I've just added a note there at the bottom of the summary around the capital programme. And it's quite a positive one in terms of the amount of schemes that are either committed or programmed to start this year, which is worth about 97% of our budgeted plans at the moment, uh, which are about £40 million of capital expenditure. So not wanting to get into too much of that detail, but more than happy to take any questions anybody might have on any aspect of the report. Thanks, Graham. Councillor Thompson, I can see you indicated. Yes. Thank you. The, the loss of council tax and business rates that we're allowed to carry over into the next three years, how will we carry that over? Will it be um, evenly across the three years or weighted toward, more towards the end? Or? So, so what? it's an interesting question because this is what we were asking government. It goes back to, I think it was around July time that all through the year we've been telling government what the impact of covid's been on our expenditure 
our income streams and funding. And when I say funding, I mean council tax and business rates. So we've been telling them all the issues. Now, what they said in terms of the funding is um, we acknowledge you've got pressures and we will support you. So it it got to the stage where the, um, the spending round came out from government in October. And at that stage, they, what they said was, if you're if you're going to have a funding deficit on council tax and business rates, we will support about three quarters of that. So what what that basically means is we look at the amount we're not going to collect this year. Government will give us a grant worth 75 percent of that. We write the deficit off over three the following three financial years equally. So in effect, we match it with a grant. So we've got a net deficit after the grant, and that's written off equally over three years. So when we've done the when we've done the budget plans for 21-22, we've had to accommodate the issues that we're seeing in the in the current year. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any any further questions? I can't see anybody indicating. So thanks for that, uh, Graham. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're on to item. Uh, eight which is the audit and assurance report period period eight i think is it october to december that's mark i think that's chair oh, um, so because a lot of things going to declare an interest yeah i just wanted to declare an interest that i'm a governor of stratford high school which is mentioned in the report okay thank you thanks um yeah so this uh the com committee at the last meeting got an update for april to september so this is a slightly shorter update, just covering the period October to December, the work we've done. Um, I think I mentioned last time, the last meeting, that I uh, see a lot of changes to the audit plan with all the changes in circumstances during the year. Um, and you see in section three of the report on page four, it again makes reference to the other work we've done around supporting the council effort um, in terms of the administration of the, the COVID-19 grants. It's been a bit less activity from our point of view in October to December, but we've still pro provided some input to that. Uh, but mainly trying to progress a number of our audits. Um, you see in section four, and then over the page on section five, um, talks about the audit reports that we've produced during the period. Um, one, one of the reports went out as a final, uh, which is very relevant on cyber security that, uh, Paul James will be, will be talking about at the end of the meeting. Um, a number of other reports issued to draft stage, and uh, currently we're in the process of finalising all those. So you'll get the details of the actual findings of them at the next update. So the likes of reviews of payroll, insurance, corporate complaints, and a school audit. Uh, and there's also a number of other audits who are progressing. I'd say at this stage, even though we haven't got uh, all the finals, um, of those reports that are a draft, there are no particular concerns in terms of opinion levels that we'd expect them to be uh, sort of amber or red. We'd expect them all to be at least medium uh, and above opinion levels. Um, in fact, uh, some of them I would expect to be high by the time they're issued as final. Um, in terms of work we've done as well as the, the, the audits, um, section six on page 90, uh, two uh, lists other areas we've been involved in as well as the, the grants um, see other items that have come to the committee strategic risk register came in November um, we've also spent some time submitting various information to the cabinet office uh, supporting the national fraud initiative uh, and there's some details of that in the report in the appendix three um, in terms of the data that's been submitted so there'll be work through the rest of this year, working with different services for any, any data matches that come up um, for potential risks of errors, fraud in transactions, a number of services, particularly the likes of uh, the fraud team and the accounts payable teams will be, will be also working on that to, to ex you know, explore any errors. Uh, and we'll report, we'll report on the details of that later in the year. Uh, we've also linked in with our HR section in terms of their induction and there's an updated e-learning on fraud uh, been added to the induction arrangements. Um, 
just and, and several other um, areas there listed grants work disabled facilities grants as well that we were involved in certifying that just just moving on to the impact of audit work as we always report on um, no no significant concerns there all recommendations to date have been accepted that we've made in the report with a lot of focus this period on schools and follow-up work um, particularly conscious that we haven't done as much audits on schools as we as we would normally expect to do and hopefully that's being rectified over the coming months but we've done a lot of work on following up previous work and checking for progress and implementing recommendations I think you'll see in the report there's fairly positive uh, outcomes in terms of um, all, all the schools there listed um, in terms of recommendations either all being implemented or most of them which was which was pleasing to see um, and you see a chart there on page 93 uh, summarizing which have been in percentage of recommendations implemented you see overall is 97 percent either been fully implemented or are in part in progress which again was pleasing to see um, just moving to section eight of the report an update on the performance against the plan and again, I did mention this last time, um, overall number of days we've spent and the work time we've had has been pretty equivalent to what we'd expected to have. But obviously the way we've spent our time has varied in some areas, um, particularly uh, schools, as I mentioned, there's been less days spent as we've rescheduled school audits um, and started to resume some uh, recently. Uh, and obviously time that we've spent around the grants work uh, is reflected in the category there, it grant checks data quality uh, in the uh, appendix one, which sets out the, the various time we spent. So there's a lot more time spent on that area than we'd expected to have done. Um, as I say, in terms of the last time on school audits, we've tried to make up for that a bit in terms of the follow-up work and, and planning in um, audits over the coming months. Um, what we're hoping really in terms of what we produce for the year, will be less in terms of numbers of reports, but hopefully with the work that's been done between now and the end of March, um, there'll be a good, good output of reports across a variety of areas so we can provide a, a reasonable audit opinion in our annual report. Um, probably in terms of numbers and targets, it would be, as I've said, the schools that will be the, the, the figure that brings us down, but we're, we're addressing that by rescheduling and certainly within 21-2. Um, building in a significant number of audits. Um, we've currently got two, uh, two school audits in progress that we're doing by a, a remote audit approach. Um, just turning in terms of the remainder of the year, um, you'll see in section nine, we just summarize uh, areas of work. One of the key ones of putting together the plan for next year. Uh, we're currently in the progress of doing that, speaking to corporate directors and heads of service. Uh, so the aim is to bring an audit plan report to the next committee meeting. We'll also bring a strategic risk update to the next committee meeting. We've started work on that with, with uh, corporate directors uh, to provide that. Um, you see in Appendix 2, uh, there's a listing of audits, audit reports, and where they're up to. Um, You'll see there's a number that say timing to be agreed on the right hand side. In those cases, they're subject to discussions uh, with various corporate directors to agree that and, and what's to be rescheduled for the 21 2 um, plan. So, the, the next update I'll give will be the annual report, which will come to the meeting after next. So, that will include the details for that, you know, for the whole year in terms of audit work we're doing and also our, our audit opinion. Um, so happy to, to answer any, any questions on, on the report. Thanks, Mark. Any questions? Jeannie, Mrs. Black. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Chair. Mark, could I just um, ask just for a benefit of what's been going on between with the audit? I mean, in terms of having enough coverage for the external audit, um, for reassurance in terms of the schools um, is the external audit going to be if you've obviously been liaising with them is it going to take a different approach because obviously taking into account all the different circumstances you've been facing 
Um, when you say, do you mean with individual schools dealing with the... Just overall, you know, obviously the next plan. Things and, with sorry. external order. I mean, we, we do have um, regular contact with, with external order. Um, I had discussions today with, with Karen. Um, so we do, we do uh, link in closely uh, on each other's work and um, external audit get a copy of all our final audit reports as well. So that can help inform their work if they've got any queries uh, and they could come back to us as well. So there is that, there's like an ongoing yeah. link okay. there. Yeah, it was just in case, you know, obviously you can only do what you can do in terms of the number of audits. So it was just whether you were then, obviously you're rescheduling them all, but whether there was anything else that would come up because you've not been able to, to do the coverage that you normally would. Yeah, I mean, we would look to prioritise, uh, and obviously any work where there is mandatory and there are deadlines, and we've certainly prioritised anything like that. For instance, last week there was a deadline to submit the National Fraud Initiative data, so we, we did that, and, and various other things during the year. Um, and as far as the schools go, um, we, we, we have kept that going. And there's, there's a draft report in progress. So there's, there's another one just started. Um, things are a little slower on that. Um, but so we've, we've tried to make up for that as well with the follow up work and doing bringing that forward a bit. Um, so hopefully you know, through the remainder of the year, as we've got used to a new approach, doing them um, oh. we should hopefully have more of those you know later in, in 2020 2021 okay thank you very much thank you Councillor Lloyd um I just the um strategic risk register um given that we've um we had a report last time has this lockdown started to affect anything on the uh, strategic risk um, register? And isn't it a living document? Um, because the thing that concerns me is we, at the moment, we don't know when this is all going to end and it has an impact on everything that the council does. So it's almost like, um, it, I, I don't know whether it needs to come to us a bit more regularly at the moment, rather. Um, it, yes, it, it is a living document, you're right. I mean, each of the uh, risks has a risk owner and each of the relevant services directorates would, would, would maintain that. Um, I think for reporting purposes, sometimes the timing of the committee meetings can be a bit difficult to do each meeting because, for instance, at the moment, they're very close to the February uh, and the March meetings. So we're actually in the middle of updating the register at the moment. So... We, we emails have come back and forth over the last few days for updating of it. So March will sort of be the next logical time. And then in the summer, when the committee next meets, we'd, they'd get another, another update then. But you're right, it is a living document in the sense each of the individual risk areas, you know, would be updated as and, as and when. Thank you for that. It's just that I can foresee that... Um, at the moment, um, we've got the, it, it, the thing in the last document. Um, sorry, the uh, the document which give, uh, gives the finances um, that you had contingencies. It's just that it concerns me is how much contingencies we need to plan ahead for, um, because, uh, for example, uh, children not not all children are at school, and sometimes, uh, for example, that's when things happen. And also, it, it, it's it, what concerns me is the volatile services, the, the, the ones that are um, dependent on need. Um, that's all. And certainly with, within the register, there's the main COVID-19 risk, sort of the headline risk, but then all the other ones, most of them will have, have, have an impact from COVID-19 and there'll be updates around that reflecting that. Yeah. Well, I know. I'm not, then, uh, yeah, OK. Thank you very much for... Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Any other questions? I can't see anybody. Okay, so on to item nine, which is the, it's a mark again, but it's the Accounts and Audit Work Programme 20, 20, 20 stroke 21. Mark? Yeah. Very briefly, Chair, on that. Um, so it's just the remaining meeting in March to go. So you see the agenda uh, listed there. That includes uh, an item from the Star Procurement Service. So we'll get a a presentation, I think, from Lorraine Cox um, at the March meeting. 
Okay, any questions for anybody? Can't see anybody. Okay, well, thanks for that. Uh, look forward to the March meeting. So I think that uh, brings us to any other uh, urgent business. I'm not aware of any, uh, Joe, do you? Non reported, Chair, no. No. So that's the end of the, uh, oh, well, we need to pass the exclusion resolution for the press and the public, but that's the end of the uh, the public part of the meeting. So if we could agree to the item 11, the exclusion of the press and public, because we need to consider this uh, security uh, matter. Can we all agree to that? Yeah, I'll take that as agreement. Thank you. Yeah. So Joe's going to close the meeting, I think. Yeah, thanks, Chair. If, if you can just give me a, a few seconds, I'll, I'll stop the stream and the recording. Hopefully I won't close the meeting. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll come yeah. back to you as soon as I've done that and let you know when we're ready to go again. If you can just give me